Hey folks, first of all, I want to apologize. I'm getting the episode up a little bit later than usual today. Um, well, actually quite a, quite a bit later. And that's because I, uh, I worked all weekend through Athletic Brewing, my day job. Uh, I went and did an event for them this weekend and definitely overestimated just how much I could squeeze in this weekend. So this, this doesn't happen often, but today's episode is coming out fairly late. But it's absolutely worth the wait because we have three-time travel photographer of the year and legendary world traveler, Gary Arndt. Uh, you're going to hear more about his story, but essentially he sold his you know life away essentially in 2007, sold his house, sold everything, and became a full-time traveler, started blogging, and he has a, a renowned travel blog called Everything Everywhere, which has won tons of awards. I, I can't overstate just how uh, just how well-known and, and, and how many accolades that Gary Arndt has. And so what does a travel writer do for a year of pandemic when you can't go anywhere? Uh, well, he, he starts a podcast naturally. So Gary has turned a lot of what he's learned in the world, things he's uh, gone through into very interesting, historical, you know, 10 minutes or less podcast episodes called the Everything Everywhere Daily History Podcast. And it's something I've actually been listening to since since finding out about it. Some of the episodes are things like the Dodo Bird, Alcohol in Early America, Ancient Colors that No Longer Exist, uh, WrestleMania. It's just very, very interesting stuff spins or twists on everyday things or things you've never heard of, places you've never heard of. So, uh, but before we get started, something that Gary talks about some is, you know, what makes these kind of adventures possible, what makes long-term adventure possible is is budgeting, is being frugal, is living well below your means. And one of the best ways to do that is used gear, buying or selling used gear. Almost ha- probably half or if not more of everything I own, all kinds of equipment that I that I use on a daily basis is used gear. My kayak is used, the paddles used, even the stinking life jacket is used. There's a limit, you know, obviously you don't want to have everything. You don't want to use underwear and you don't want to use rubber. Or, or there's some things safety wise you don't want to use, but for everything else, definitely check out rerouted.co. It's a great place to buy used gear, but also sell used gear. So if you got stuff hanging in your closet, throw it on there, make a little extra cash, and help somebody get out there and have the adventure of a lifetime. So that is again rerouted.co. And also check out Gary's podcast, Everything Everywhere Daily History Podcast. All right, folks, welcome to the podcast. Uh, gosh, we got an exciting episode. You heard a little bit about it in the intro of the show, uh, but I want to welcome you to the show. Gary, how you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we, we were talking about it a little bit before, uh, but I always ask this first, where are you coming from today? And, and if that's not home, where is home for you? Uh, right now, I'm in Wisconsin, and this is where I'm currently living, about 30 minutes outside of Green Bay. Oh, Fantastic. You, you you like to keep a little bit of a, a close eye on your football team. Yeah, I'm part owner. Uh, I have that on my website, and and people don't usually get it. If if you're an American and you understand football, you you kind of probably know what I'm talking about. But if you're not, because most fo- you know NFL owners are millionaires, except for the Green Bay Packers. And yeah, I bought a share of stock back in '97, I think. And uh, yeah, so I'm an owner. That's too cool, man. What a great idea. You know, I've often looked at that and thought, thought, no wonder that that's how you build a loyal fan base for essentially eternity is allow them to be owners. What a cool, cool idea. You're obviously not known for uh, being a a part part owner of the Green Bay Packers, um, but you're really more known as as a traveler, as a a writer, a blogger. Uh, But I want to kind of go all the way back. Did you grow up in Wisconsin? And if so, what what did you grow up doing? What was kind of your childhood like? Uh, Yep, grew up in Wisconsin. Never really traveled that much. Uh, You know, occasionally summer car trips. I remember once we went out to South Dakota. That was about it. Uh, A lot of camping. I was in Boy Scouts. I was an Eagle Scout. Kind of pretty normal. I You know, one of the things I famously tell people is that I never saw salt water until I was 21 years old. It, is that just, you know, obviously the proximity of the ocean from Wisconsin is quite a bit farther than uh, than where I grew up in Florida. Is it just, you know, practicality, never made it to the ocean for whatever reason? Yeah, I mean, you're in the middle of the country and to to get to the ocean is, you know, quite a trip. And I've, you know, I've told that to people in like islands in the Pacific and they just can't fathom it. And then, of course, they've never seen snow. 
So it's just all part of, you know, where you grow up and how you grow up. Did it blow you away? Was it underwhelming? How, how was that experience? I was, as my senior year in college, we were going to the national debate tournament, which was being held in Bellingham, Washington. We flew into Seattle. We were in a van. We were driving kind of on this road near a park near Puget Sound. And I said, stop the van, stop the van. And everyone's like, what? Like there was an emergency or something. I throw open the door and I run outside. I tasted the water because I needed to verify that it was in fact salty because I had never experienced salt water before. So I, I needed to check that out. But I've seen the same thing. I remember in college, I remember this girl, she was from Hawaii. She had never seen snow before. The first time it snowed, she went outside and just went nuts and because she had never experienced it. That is too cool, man. That, you know, it, it really is all about all about experience, all about perspective. So, you know, growing up in Wisconsin, uh, being an Eagle Scout, uh, just just living your life, living living, you know, going on your little vacations here and there. Can you just take us in, in, in a way that isn't just arduous for you to retell again? How you got to to the first country you visited, or where did you start to be introduced into travel itself? So the first real introduction, I started a very early internet company back in the 90s, uh, back in like 1994, and I sold it in 1998, and I sold it to a uh, global technology company, and they had offices all over the world. And I kind of conned them into sending me to their offices to talk about the internet. And so they sent me on a three-week whirlwind tour in January 1999, and I went to Tokyo, Taipei, Singapore, Frankfurt, Paris, Brussels, and London. Literally circumnavigated the globe. And that was the first time I'd ever really been anywhere. And it was really eye-opening. And after that, I, I did a, a short trip on my own. I went to Iceland just for the heck of it. Uh, went back to school for a few years just because just I wanted to. And I went on a research project to Argentina. And I came up with this idea, having kind of tasted it a little bit, I was at a point in my life where I didn't want to go get a PhD because I saw what they went through and I realized I like learning, but I didn't like research. And I came up with this idea of selling my house to travel around the world for a year. I had no kids, had no wife. I had money saved up. There was, there was no reason I couldn't do it. So uh, 2005, I hatched this idea. It took me about 18 months to tie up all the loose ends. And in March 2007, I turned over the keys to my house and I started traveling. And I told everyone I would travel for about a year. Personally, I thought it would be about two years. And it kind of ended up just never stopping. I, I didn't have a home for nine years. And the last five years, I've had an apartment, but I would spend, say, a third to a half of the year traveling. What gave you the confidence to like you, like you, told, you just said, con your company that bought you to travel the world. Because that's, you know, I could see someone wanting to do that. But what gave you personally confidence to say, not only do I want to try to talk them into doing this, not because it's a hobby I already have, it's, it's going to be a totally new experience for me. How, how did you how, how did you come up with that? Uh, so after I sold it, I was like this weird position on the org chart where they legally had to keep me employed but I wasn't doing anything. There was like That's no great. one above me or below me in the org chart. So I would literally show up to work at 10, make sure everyone saw me, say hello, surf the internet for a couple hours, go to take a late lunch, and then never come back. And they were paying me like six figures to do this. How did you feel about that? That's, that's, I've never, you know, that's, that's got to be a weird feeling. <laughs> it was their idea. So. <laughs> If they couldn't afford if they couldn't afford it they wouldn't do it so they they obviously you know, they they wanted me tied up in a, a non compete and then that make me employed for for this time so I figure you know make use of me let's do this you have all these offices all over you bought this company uh, why don't you send me out and try to talk it up and you know because we were basically doing internet uh, web application development integrating databases with websites, which today is nothing. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, but back then it was still kind of novel. And so they agreed to it. It didn't, you know, wasn't a big deal to them. So, uh, that was kind of my first, uh, real travel experience. What was immediately some of the biggest misconceptions about travel that you had versus going into it that you started learning once you started getting out there? Man, I don't know if I had any 
conceptions at all. I just kind of went into it uh, with my eyes open. And I remember my first night, we landed in Tokyo and I was kind of jet lagged, so I wasn't sleeping, but I was also just so fascinated with everything. I was watching these Japanese soap operas and game shows all night long and just like looking at everything in the room, you know, whether it was in Japanese or how just the little things are different. Because, you know, the, the first trip I took out of the United States, like most people, was to Canada. In Canada, pretty much everything is the same, right? But there are little things that are different. And your, your eye goes to those things that are different. So there'll be French on a lot of the packaging for everything. Things are in kilometers, not miles. Stuff like that are different brands, whatever. In Japan, everything was different. And so I found my eye kept going to things that were the same. Like you go, oh, they have 7-Elevens. You go into a 7-Eleven. Oh, they have Lay's potato chips, but it's seaweed flavored instead of, you know, sour cream and chive or something like that. Um, and I, I've noticed this whenever I travel. In fact, first several years I was traveling, I would go to a country and I would purposely at least make one trip to a McDonald's just to write about the experience because McDonald's are pretty much the same everywhere, but there are little differences. And those little differences are usually cultural things about that country. It could be uh, something on the, on the menu or, uh, you know, something else, how you, how they seat people or, you know, there's beer at McDonald's in, in some countries in Europe, stuff like that. Were you nervous about this? That, 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 that's quite a bit to take on from someone who had seen the ocean, you know, not that much prior, pretty much a senior in college. I was more nervous when I started traveling full time in 2007. Mm. Um, when I was on this trip, it was all pretty much I was meeting people everywhere I was going. Uh, there were local offices that, that took care of my hotel reservations, all that stuff. So it wasn't a big deal. But when I went off on my own, the first place I, I basically started going west. So I started in Minneapolis where I was living at the time, drove to Dallas, took a train to LA, flew to Hawaii. While I was in Hawaii, I learned how to scuba dive, you know, I went to Volcanoes National Park. And then the first international place I visited was Tahiti. And they speak French. Today, no problem. I, I, I don't speak French fluently, but I, I know a few words I can get by. But it was really intimidating at the time. And so I would take, uh, they have these kind of, I guess you could call it a bus, but they're really cheap and ways to get around the island. And I avoided taking it, uh, and I took a cab instead, which you're going to pay a lot more money for, but I was just kind of intimidated by the experience. And uh, gradually, you just sort of, you get used to it. It's just a confidence you get when you're traveling. Now, you could drop me into pretty much any country in the world, even if I don't speak the language, I think I'd get by. Because there's just certain commonalities about traveling that, you know, are the same everywhere. What's the bug that bites you now then for someone who would lay in a hotel room in Japan for the first time? And, and, you know, I, I understand that that situation I've been there, um, not to Japan, but to that experience where every little thing's different from the utensils in the drawer to the drawers itself, to the refrigerator, to the way the, the walls are painted. It's like everything's so different. It, it draws you in it, you know, it's interesting. What draws you in now being so experienced? Uh, the thing I got started doing early in my trip and that's kind of taken over is I've really made a focus of visiting historical sites and especially UNESCO world heritage sites. So I've been to over 400 UNESCO world heritage sites around the world, uh, which is, you know, there's over a thousand, but very few people have been to that many, uh, simply because most of them are not popular tourist attractions. There are some that are very popular, like the Taj Mahal and the pyramids and stuff like that. But most of them, you really have to go out of your way to, to see. And uh, I've also been visiting a lot of the National Park Service sites in the United States. In fact, if it, if it wasn't for the pandemic last year, I would have finalized visiting all of the, uh, the national parks proper in the U.S. We had a guy on here a couple weeks ago, uh, Andy McGee. He visited every national park site in a calendar year. And that's all 423 now, all in a calendar year in 2019. Thankfully, he didn't try it in 2020, but it was a very fascinating endeavor, fascinating conversation. Obviously, very quick going through them, but he had been a National Park geek his whole life, so he had been to many of these places before. I thought that was a pretty cool trip. Yeah, I thought about doing it. Um, I've been to about 
220 of the 422 sites now. Mm -hmm. And it's just something I sort of do bit by bit. Like, uh, you know, one of my last real trips was last year I was in Arizona and I just took that time to go visit a whole bunch of stuff in Arizona because Arizona has a, a ton of sites. I drove down to Chicago, I think two years ago. And then rather than drive back immediately to Minneapolis where I was living, I drove through St. Louis. And so I visited the uh, Lincoln site uh, in Springfield, went to the St. Louis uh, Arch, and then visited some sites in Iowa on the way back. So I, I do stuff like that all the time where I'll just kind of go out of my way uh, to visit some sites. Let's draw it back to uh, after that first trip, you know, Japan, Singapore, France, all that. What happened or, or what led to wanting to do it full time? And were, what were your goals then? Because, you know, it's, it's great to say I just want to travel. But what what was the reason? Why did you want to do this? I enjoyed travel. You know, I'd always I had a, I have a massive National Geographic collection, mostly sitting in boxes right now because uh, I've never really unpacked them from 2007 when I originally packed them up. Um, but I'd never really traveled. So it was it was kind of one of those why not things. And then when I started, it was just, you know, the world's really big. And I I remember before I started. I'd read books like a thousand places to see before you die. Oh, I want to go here. I want to go here. I want to go here. And then when you get on the road, you discover so much more mm. that you never even knew about. And I have a list of places I want to go now after having traveled the world for 14 years, having been to 130 countries, there's probably more stuff I want to see now because I keep learning about more stuff. And when you like, for example, when someone goes to Italy for the first time, they go to Rome, maybe they go to Florence, maybe they go to Venice. You know, that's kind of the typical go to Rome. Maybe they make a side trip to see the Leaning Tower of Pisa or whatever because they know those things, right? They, they know the, the gondolas in Venice, Michelangelo's David, the Sistine Chapel, all that stuff are things in the popular consciousness. And we know those things. And we don't know much else. We don't know about the walls of Lucca or the towers of San Gimignano, which are in Italy, which are really cool but very few people go to see them. Most Americans can't tell you the name of another city in France outside of Paris. I try this sometime. It's actually true. And so we, we go to the places that we know about, and that's what leads to things like over tourism. There are certain national parks that get all the visitors, right? It's, it's Yellowstone, it's Yosemite, it's the Grand Canyon. In Canada, it's Banff. I'm here to tell you, and I, and I, I tell this on every interview I do, the greatest national park in the world that I've been to is Nahani National Park in the Northwest Territories in Canada. No one goes there. It gets 800 visitors a year. That was pre-pandemic. And I can keep talking about it as much as I want, but it's never going to become popular because most, most Canadians don't even know about it. Uh, and if they do know about it, it's a hard place to get to. You know, It requires effort and work. And so it doesn't get any, any visitors, whereas you can just take a three-hour trip out of San Francisco and get to Yosemite. And that's what most people do. For you, do you, do you have any sort of theory or, or anything you've noticed around maybe layers of discoverability or layers of kind of localization of, of experiences or places to see? Have you experienced anything like that? I think it's a matter of focusing on something or having an interest and then using that to guide your travels. Uh, one of the things I've been doing, I've been, I just subscribed to, um, the great courses plus, which is this really actually great service where they have all these lectures. And I've been watching this lecture, uh, from this guy as a professor about cathedrals, learning all sorts of stuff. I didn't know, including, uh, doing overviews of places that I've been. And he's pointing out stuff that I completely didn't notice when I was there, kind of making me want to go back. And uh, there, there's lots of stuff like that, whether you're interested in the history of World War II or ancient Rome or you have an interest in botany or animals or dinosaurs or whatever it might be. Uh, there's always going to be something that you can actually go see that will probably pique your interest and you can go and geek out over. Something I told my wife recently was you can take any sort of square mile or square, you know, 10 miles or whatever it is. And, and the, the amount of subcultures that are overlapping in that area is just enormous. It's ridiculous. And so 
for each of those subcultures and each of those kind of areas of, of interest or hobbies, there could be, you know, meccas all around you for different things around the world. And I'm sure as a world traveler, it's almost frustrating sometimes how much there really is to see. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of people will say, uh, you know, I've been to Germany or I've been to China or something like that. Like China's big, really big. And I had this thing when I started, I went to a lot of tiny countries. So I was going to Samoa, Tonga, Vanuatu. I was in Liechtenstein, all these tiny countries before I went to Russia or India. Because to simply say, oh, I've been to India. I went to the Taj Mahal. No, you, yeah, you've technically been to India. I get it. But you haven't been to India because it's big, right? And that's like, I, I meet people all the time. They say, oh, where are you from? I'm from the United States. Oh, I've been in New York. Well. Yeah, New York is the United States. I get it. But it's also not the United States in so far as New York is really kind of its own thing. There's nothing else like New York in the United States. And it's very different from, say, driving around the Midwest because the U.S. is so big and there's so many different parts to it. And there's a lot of countries like that. Uh, even countries that aren't necessarily as big as the U.S. are still rather big. And it takes time uh, to really explore it. So it's not just that I've been to a lot of places, but I've driven all over South Africa, Australia, Germany, uh, and even just, you know, getting a car and driving around like Fiji. Uh, I've done a fair amount of driving in Japan, places like that. So just because you've been somewhere once doesn't mean you've done that. There's still always much more to see. And, and, and from, a, some, from someone from here or for someone from here, you can just see how preposterous that is by just how much of the U.S. there is to see, how many different just different layers. There are so many different types of places. And, you know, I, we wouldn't necessarily know that about other parts of the country if you've never been, but you can kind of just relay that knowledge you have of this place to anywhere in the world and realize just a few hours in either direction can be, feel like a totally different planet. What are your goals when you travel somewhere, either somewhere new, a country or an area? Uh, Do you have a system in place or something that you try to achieve when you get there, whether it be from a, the perspective of culture or food or any sort of, you know, museums, is, is there something that you try to make sure you hit in every place you go? I'll usually, if I haven't been there before, try to focus on world heritage sites. So my last international trip was one year ago, February, 2020. I was in Portugal and I was there for a conference. And after the conference, I had like 10 days, uh, where I had nothing planned. And I'll do this a lot. I'll go speak at different conferences around the world because they'll fly you in and out. And then I'll just use that because they're buying the ticket to just go do something on my own. Right. Um, So I attended, I didn't know what I was going to do. I literally, the day it started, I didn't know what I was going to do. One option was I was going to go to the Canary Islands. One option was I was going to go to the Azores. The other option was I was going to rent a car and just drive around Portugal. So I ended up doing that. And I actually just took a taxi to Sintra, which was outside of Lisbon, hung out there for two days, and I rented a car, and then just kind of drove around visiting these sites. Uh, A lot of monasteries and convents, uh, their World Heritage Sites, Uh, the university in Coimbra, which is a real fascinating uh, old medieval university, Uh, some Roman ruins, not many people think of in Portugal, but they're definitely there. And a whole bunch of other stuff. And uh, I just kind of made it up every day as I went along. I just figured, okay, how far can I drive? And I've done this so often where I've kind of got it down where I know, okay, if I wake up at this, okay, I'm two hours away from this site. I can arrive there at 8 or 9 a.m. right when it opens. It will take me one or two hours to probably see it, which is kind of average. If it's just like a building or something, Uh, then maybe I'll get in the car and then I can drive and get, visit a second site in the afternoon, spend some time there, drive, and then I'll be in this city in that you know in the evening, which will put me set me up for the next day where I'm going to go visit X Y Z. So yeah, it could be museums, historical sites, national parks, whatever. Uh, it's kind of interesting. And having been to that part of Portugal, now if I go there again, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm probably going to go see again because I didn't get to see it last time. How much are you interacting with people? When you go and visit, is it something that you're, you're making a point to do, or is it just really when it comes to logistics that, that require interacting with folks? It depends. 
it depends primarily how long you're staying. Like in the example I just gave in Portugal, it was primarily just a road trip. So you're in your car a lot and there's not a whole bunch of interaction unless it's, you know, you're, they may have guides. Sometimes I always recommend getting a guide when you stop someplace because they're going to know better than you. Like if, if you can get someone to actually explain to you what's at a historic site or a cathedral, it's going to be a far richer experience. And you just walk around kind of just staring at old stuff and not knowing what it means. Um, so that's always a great thing to do. And also when you, you know, if you stop to eat or something, uh, despite the fact that I just mentioned that I used to write about going to McDonald's, I'll usually try to just stop somewhere that's kind of local and, and, you know, get whatever, you know, is on the menu. Um, and it, that's become so much easier. You know, when I started traveling in 2007, we didn't have smartphones and now we do. And so finding those kind of places and finding places to stay and finding operating hours, it's almost like cheating. It's so easy. If someone would have told you a year, year and a half ago, hey, you're not going to be able to travel for a year and may, maybe longer. What, I mean, what would what would you have thought? I would have assumed that I broke my leg or something had happened to me personally. The idea that the travel industry would have just vanished and be taken up by the rapture, which is basically what happened, you know, from the beginning of March to the end of March of 2020, just disappeared. And at first in March, I thought, well, first of all, I probably had COVID. When I came back from that trip from Portugal, I had the flu really bad for a week. And in hindsight, I probably had COVID. But there weren't a lot of tests available at, back then. You know, every er, the talk back then was still about China, right? It, it was primarily hitting China, restricting travel to China. That's what it was about. So in hindsight, I probably think I had it. I never had it checked. But I was I had some some contacts I had in China and I say, like, oh well maybe we could do something. I thought this would last through, you know, April. So May probably start traveling again. Well that was wrong. And then I thought, well, you know, okay, I'm gonna run some tours. I was thinking of maybe doing something we'll do something domestic just to be safe. So in like October, November, maybe I could do something with uh, national parks in the Southwest. Nope, that didn't happen. And I've, now I've just sort of given up trying to plan or predict anything because I have no clue what's going to happen. How are you enjoying your time in Wisconsin? Um, yeah, I moved here in August. Uh, kind of a double whammy. I lived in Minneapolis and I lived a block off Lake Street where all the riots happened. And so my neighborhood just got mm. devastated. And in August, I, 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 you know, one of the reasons I lived where I lived, it was a really nice area. I was, everything was in walking distance stores, theaters, shops, restaurants, everything. And, uh, then all of a sudden nothing was in walking distance anymore because everything was, was shuttered up. And three months after everything happened, it was still that way. So one day I went and rented a U-Haul and I put all my stuff in it and I left and uh, I've been in Wisconsin, uh, which is where my family is ever since. Uh, but the, the big change for me is that, you know, basically the business I was in was in the travel industry. And that disappeared. And so I made a, a pretty big pivot back in July. I, I launched a new podcast. And it's not a travel podcast per se. Because the thing that I never cared about with travel was talking about flights and hotels and frequent flyer programs and all that stuff. Right. And that gets most of the attention if you read like a travel section of a newspaper. What interested me, like I've been telling you for the last you know several minutes, is – the why, you know, the history and the background of these places. So I, I did a, a podcast that's just that. That's just interesting stories of people, places, and things. It still has kind of one foot in the world of travel in that I can still talk about these places that I visited, but it's not exclusively travel, which doesn't limit it quite as much. Everything Everywhere Daily History Podcast is what it's called. And, you know, I, I listened to I listened to one episode, the, the most recent uh, to, from today, Base Units of Measurement. And I'll just say it went in 10 minutes. It went into much more detail than I than I expected it was going to, to the point where I'm like, this is a this is a lesson. This is like a, a, a legitimate look into where the base units of measurement came from. Where, where is this just what you enjoy looking up and putting together to for other people to to basically ingest is um, or is it just something you have, you know, floating around in your brain? How much of this is already in your brain versus what you got to look up? Uh, quite a bit. I already know. Uh, for, for example, that episode, I knew most of it. So it was, it was easy to write. 
once I came up with the idea for it, I was able to, some of my longest episodes are the easiest to write. Some of the shortest are the hardest to write if I have to do a lot of research. But yeah, it's, it's, it's designed to be highly eclectic. It's designed to be, because, you know, so much of what we're fed on the internet is determined by an algorithm. And you've probably experienced this. If you go to YouTube and you just watch like one video, then it starts showing you all sorts of the same stuff. And you may not necessarily want to keep seeing that. You just wanted to see that one thing. But the algorithms keep, and that's how we get these bubbles where everyone only hears and communicates with people who think the same, believe the same, and everything else. So the idea of the podcast was to learn something new every day about things you might not have even known that you didn't know. Um, and it, it could be something like science or it could be something with history. Um, uh, one of the, the episodes I just did was on uh, the Roman punishment of decimation. And decimation or something saying something was decimated is you know, a common phrase that exists in English, but it had a very specific meaning in ancient Rome where if a, a unit fled on the battlefield, their punishment was one in every 10 men would be killed by the other nine. And you might have to beat to death like your best friend that you fought with for years. Um, Jeez. And then I did, you know, then I've also done one on Andre the Giant. Yeah, I know I saw he that. Is the probably the greatest drinker in human history. Yeah. I, I don't know how anyone could possibly consume more alcohol than Andre the Giant did. <laughs> well, you got, I'm, I'm sure if you're that size, it helps a little bit. Seven, seven feet oh, plus yeah. and, you know, what, 500 pounds or something. <laughs> the other wrestlers he would drink with would count, like, the number of drinks he had. And there were several people who testify that he consumed over 100 cans of beer in one sitting. I've, I've heard that. I've, I've heard that. That's, uh, that's mind-blowing. <laughs> Well, that's why, you know, it's a legend, Legend of Andre the Giant. I'll, I'll be happy to listen to that one. And what I love is they're just a few minutes, like everything from five, literally five minutes to 10 minutes to, you know, just a, a hair over 11, 12 minutes. And I'm not going to lie, this is going to probably be one of my new, this is definitely going to be on my new rotation, but I think I'm really going to enjoy this just because, you know, you've got got a great voice. I'm sure you've been told that a million times, but um can really, you know, just listen to your stories and listen to the things you've learned around the world. And it's just this pursuit of, of your, um, what interests you and what, what you just find, you know, fascinating has probably what's led to this entire life in general. Uh, so this is just, a, a an ex- another expression of that, just like your, your images are, your pictures are. Yeah. When, when it gets back to traveling again, and so I'm not even planning dates for this yet. Uh, one of the things I'm going to start offering my listeners is tours, but they're going to be different tours. So I've, I've run tours in the past kind of as a travel photographer, which is probably what I was, I'm, I'm best known for. Uh, and, and we've done, I've done stuff in Africa, national parks in the U S Italy, Australia, stuff like that. But what I want to do is do a tour where, okay, we're going to go to Rome. We're just going to have one hotel room. We're not going to run around. And we're going to see all the stuff nobody sees. Nero's palace. No one goes to visit that. It's there. It's underground. They found the original artwork, and it's all been amazingly preserved. Uh, The place where Julius Caesar was killed is currently underneath a restaurant. So you have to go there and uh, ask the owner, and he'll take you downstairs, and he'll show you. It's it's the the ruins of Pompey's Theater. And there's all sorts of stuff like that, that that I've been able to see, some of which is outside of just outside of Rome. Uh, but there's a lot of places like that where there's amazing things that, you know, if you're going to go to Rome and you're there for two or three days, you know, what are you going to see? You're going to go to Trevi Fountain. You're going to go to the Forum, the Colosseum. And you're going to go to the Vatican. And that's what everybody does. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But there's so much more. And it's like that in a lot of different places. And I think there's um, a lot to be said for doing travel more in depth. And hopefully one of the things that comes out of this pandemic is – people that are willing to go to to different places because I think over tourism really was a problem. And the problem I always felt wasn't that there's too much tourism, but there's too many, too many people going to the same place at the same time. And there are so many amazing places out there that they just don't know about. And if they knew about it, they would go to those places. Absolutely. I, I, I'm sure you've experienced this, a place you were really looking forward to the, the, the experience being, 
dampened or tampered because of the amount of people. You're not really able to enjoy it versus going somewhere you, you might not even been thinking about and hardly anyone's there. And it's just such such an incredible experience that you weren't expecting. Uh, let me give you a good example. Uh, Barcelona gets tons of tourists. Barcelona does not need any more tourists. One hour north of Barcelona, not even, in Catalonia still, is the city of Girona. I actually spent three months in Girona once. And they filmed Game of Thrones there. Their old quarter is fantastic. Their cathedral is amazing. Tons of, of rich traditions. You're not far from the coast. And nobody goes to Girona. Nobody. Yet, because everybody, they know about Barcelona. And that's what they know. There's a high-speed train that goes from Barcelona to Girona. It's easy to do. And just north of Girona is Figueres. They got the Dali Museum. And because I spent three months in this place, I got to go into the Pyrenees and uh, explore a lot of the s smaller communities that I didn't know about beforehand. And I saw all this really cool stuff. And it, this is especially true, I think, in, in places like Europe or Asia that are, quite frankly, older than the United States or even, you know, most of what we have in North America or even South America. The ancient things we have tend to be like Native American type things. And outside of maybe the Southwest where you have some Anastasi culture, uh, places like Mesa Verde, Chaco Canyon, like in the Midwest and the East, there's not really that much. Uh, and even our history isn't really that deep. Um, but whereas when you go to Europe, there's stuff everywhere. You can go into a random church in a village and see paintings that are centuries old that have just been there. And it's just, it's just their church. That's all it is. And it's going to be an experience like you're, you know, you wouldn't have anywhere else because, yeah, it's not a grand cathedral, but there's also not 10,000 people there at the same time you are like you would if you went to the Sagrada Familia. Wow. Right now, savings goals might feel out of reach, but with the U.S. Bank mobile app, we can help you put money aside in a way that won't make you miss it. Using personalized insights, you can save in a way that works in real life and all the curveballs that come with it. So let's get you closer to whatever it is you're saving for. Because at U.S. Bank, even our tools are smart enough to put people first. U.S. Bank. We'll get there together. Equal housing lender, member FDIC. You know, I, I would love to ask, what are some of the biggest misconceptions about your lifestyle, about what you've done um, from folks from the outside that you've heard over the years? Uh, people think travel is glamorous. And there is this uh, current crop of like Instagram influencers who are trying to perpetuate this myth by showing themselves always eating fancy foods, drinking champagne, wearing evening gowns uh, everywhere. And I love travel. I, you know, I've, I've walked the walk, but it's not glamorous. It seldom is. I have been in some really crappy rooms because I don't, I don't stay in luxury hotels or anything. You know, maybe I'll stay in like a guest house, two star hotel type thing, or I'll even stay in a hostel, but I'll get my own room. So that's kind of the level where I'll stay at. Uh, and that, that's not glamorous. I'm not eating out at fine dining all the time. Uh, you know, a standard meal for me, if I'm running around Europe, will be to go to a kebab stand. That's, you know, fine with me. Um, th that's the big thing. And the other misconception is that it's dangerous. And the, the reason is, is because the further we get away from something, the less knowledge we have of it. Uh, so when something happens in a different country, and let's say you have a friend who's there, you may say, oh, are, are you all right? And I remember after the, uh, the bombing at the Boston Marathon, I actually sent a note to someone who always was worried about me traveling who lived in California. And I said, oh, I heard there was a bombing in America. Are you all right? Now, for someone who lives in the United States, that's ridiculous, right? That was in Boston. Boston is far away from California. But it's the same th approach we take to other countries. Uh, we paint it with there – are, there have been problems with drug cartels in Mexico. That's a fact. Almost all of that is in the north, not in like Cancun or the Yucatan Peninsula. The crime rate down there is very low. It, I, I think I saw once it was the equivalent of like Finland. But when we hear something about Mexico, 
we paint the whole country, you know, with the same brush, but the regions are very different. Um, or something gets put in the news, you know, cause we only hear bad things. You know, the news is never about good things and then it's never supplanted by anything else. And so that bad thing lingers in our consciousness. So when I bring up Colombia to most people, you know, Pablo Escobar and drug cartels are the things that they think about. And really that hasn't been a problem there in almost 30 years. That that's a generation removed. That's, you know, Miami vice type 80 stuff, but there's been very little to replace that in, in popular consciousness and other places they just get tainted with the whole area. So like Oman and Jordan are great places to visit. Great places. Uh, they've, they've never had problems with civil wars or terrorism or anything like that. Uh, outside of maybe a few small cases, just no more than the U.S. Uh, but when something happens in, in the Middle East, they get tainted with that broad brush. And maybe the worst case I ever heard, when there was an Ebola outbreak several years ago in Sierra Leone, People were canceling trips to South Africa. Sierra Leone is closer to London than it is to South Africa, right? You should be canceling trips to Europe if, if that's your level of concern. But because it's in, quote unquote, Africa, which, by the way, is really big, and, until you've flown across all of Africa, like, you know, it's like taking a flight across the Pacific, except it's all land. Uh yeah, we, we, we paint things with this broad brush because we're not familiar with it. And I have been literally in the middle of massive. And by, when I say in the middle, I mean, on one side of the street where hundreds of cops in riot gear. And on the other side of the street were thousands of protesters. And I'm in the middle with a fancy camera. Um, unless you're in the middle of a lot of this stuff, it's, it, it's not a thing. Bangkok 2010, which is where the thing I just described just happened. Uh, there were these big protests going on. And I remember these notable travel figures in the U.S. saying, now is not the time to go to Thailand. And everything was happening in a couple square block radius in Bangkok. That's all. That's where the protests were happening. And it would be the equivalent of seeing what happened in like uh, January in Washington, D.C. when the Capitol got attacked and then saying, oh, well, yeah, I'm not going to Yellowstone this year. <laughs> right. Yeah, Isn't I mean, it, it sounds absurd yeah, if you're an American, right. but it's exactly the the same logic we use in other countries. Unbelievable. Well, well, well. Speaking of that, you know, what what other what are maybe some misconceptions going the other way in the good way? What are some of the things you you maybe enjoy that people don't realize is is an enjoyable aspect of travel? You know, just being able to uh, to talk to people. For you know, for a lot of people I meet, they've never been to the United States. They're ne they're never going to. They may have never even met an American before. So to them, I'm America, right? I, I may be there, for, especially if you're going kind of out of their way. I'm, I'm the only representative of this country they've ever seen. And what they know, they know from movies and television and stuff like that. And I've met people who truly do believe that we have gunfights every day and car chases. And that you know Brad Pitt. Yeah. Or, you know, I, and I, I have met people who they go on an around the world trip and they land in Los Angeles and then they go to Hollywood thinking that they're going to see celebrities that that does not happen. What an interesting world we live in. So, you know, for folks that, that, you know, like you said, a lot of the folks you meet will never go to the U S and a lot of folks, uh, listening to this, most folks are probably never going to have the extent of travel experience that you have. I know we've had a lot of guests that have visited every country in the world, for instance, a lot of UNESCO World Heritage Sites, all the national parks. What what advice do you have for folks that, that, that might desire to do something like this but really don't know where to start? Um, a lot of us do have families, do have mortgages, do have those things. Uh, what What do you say to those people? not every point in everyone's life is going to be a good time to travel. So that's, that's just a fact. Uh, but it doesn't mean that there's no point in your life that you can't travel. And one of the, the problems people have is they think travel is expensive because when you go on vacation, it's not like, Oh, your bank says, well, you were gone for two weeks. So you don't have to pay your mortgage for those two weeks because you weren't using your house. It doesn't work that way. But, if you actually travel long term and let's say you have a point in your life where you're going to be taking a break, maybe it's between jobs, maybe your kids leave the house, go to college, maybe you're going to move, whatever it is, 
you might be able to say, okay, um, rather than move right away, let's wait three or four months. We'll put our stuff in storage. We'll go travel and then we'll come back. And during that period, you're not paying for utilities, rent, mortgage, insurance, um, food, you know, all the stuff that you have to pay for to live, which can be quite a bit when you add all that up. Um, when I was traveling, I didn't have to pay any of that. And that goes a long way. And the other way you can really save money traveling is to just go to places that are not expensive. And if you go to Southeast Asia, Central America, different places like that, you're going to save a lot of money as opposed to if you want to go visit Switzerland. Switzerland and Norway and Iceland are great places. I'm not knocking them, but they are expensive. And the cost for food and transportation and lodging is going to be a lot. Uh, as, as if you were to go to say Costa Rica or, you know, even Nicaragua is probably the most affordable place in kind of our hemisphere right now, uh, and doesn't get a lot of tourists, but yeah, it's, you, there's a point in your life. I think everyone should try to make it a point at some point in their life. Maybe it's after high school or college, or like I said, before retirement or whenever to travel for three months straight. I think that's doable for most people. You know, if there if there's a group of people that 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 realize what actually is possible and get influenced by people just doing things a lot differently and saying not not being shocked by saying, hey, you can honestly travel for three or four months pretty easily. You can figure it out. It's our listeners. They we get enough people doing things completely counterculturally that uh, that they're used to it and they can they they know that it's possible and they can figure it out. This is too cool. It, w w can I ask you this? You know, when the world starts opening back up, what is one place that you are really looking forward to visiting? Maybe a place to revisit or somewhere you've never been. I have no answer to that. All right. Um, and I, I've gotten that question quite a bit, and I'm purposely not answering it because I don't want to start getting my hopes up as to when I can start traveling again because I got burned uh, in the last year. And right now, to be completely honest, my focus is, is kind of just doing this podcast because it's an everyday thing. I'll travel again. I know that. But I'm not I, – I have a lot of friends who have been traveling already, and I'm in some groups with some very extreme travelers who kind of never stopped. And I don't know how wise that that, that really is. I'm certainly not going to suggest people do that. But I've traveled a lot in the last decade and a half, like a lot. And I'm pretty okay right now just staying in one place for a while. Um, yeah, I'm getting some stuff done. Not only have I launched this new thing and I, and I want to make it successful, but uh, I've, I've also started, you know, I've, I've been learning Latin the last several months uh, just because. Uh, I've always kind of been fascinated by it. And so I've, I've bought books and I'm, I'm doing stuff and I spend about, you know, an hour every day uh, doing that. And I probably wouldn't have had the time to do that before. So yeah, this is, this is kind of what I'm doing right now. And when I start traveling in, you know, maybe I'll, I'll do it differently. I don't foresee myself, you know, traveling for years on end anymore. Uh, I've kind of done that. Uh, and I probably did it too long to be quite honest. I got really burned out at the end, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll travel again. I'm pretty satisfied just doing what I'm doing for right now. 200 episodes into your podcast. Is it cool to see it grow around the world? I'm sure it's being played in a lot of the places you've been, and I'm, I'm sure that's kind of exciting, kind of fun to think about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's growing. And, you know, I have uh, large audiences on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, 100,000, you know, followers and everything. Podcasting is very different because it really does uh, reward a time commitment. Like it, it, you, you look at most successful podcasts, they've been around for a while. Yeah. And, and I have another podcast that I do called this week in travel. We've been doing for 12 years. Holy uh, crap. It, wow. Yeah. It, we're, we're kind of redoing it because it's, it's been hard to do <laughs> this year because we've had nothing to talk about, but there's no algorithm that you can game, right? There's no podcast company that controls all podcasting that can put you on a suggested user list or give you a verified check mark or anything like that. So it's really done through word of mouth and, you know, the experience you had is like, wow, this is really cool. I, 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 I get those dribbling in all the time and it just kind of has to grow organically and that's just how it works. And there are some things you can do to kind of, to push it along, but you just kind of have to put in the time and that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Gary, it's just a, 
a huge honor to have you on the show. You're you're a legend in this world, and uh, I just appreciate taking a little bit of time to talk to us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Always enjoy doing it. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.